Hello! <laughs> Welcome to Archival Adventures. Uh, I'm Anthony Wright Day Hernandez, Community Collections Archivist here at Virginia Tech, and this is uh, my Wednesday archive stream. Um, the setup is slightly different today, so please do let me know if the music to voice balance is off at all for you. Uh, So trying to make sure that I can actually see the chat. Um, so I have a, uh, the, my main uh, work laptop has been replaced with a new machine and so some of the settings um, had to be changed. Music is a little high, voice a little low. Okay, um, I will adjust. Let me know if that is better uh, as far as the audio balance goes. <clears throat> and also, hello, welcome everybody. It's good to see you here. Uh, welcome to my viewers on whichever uh, channel you happen to be watching this on. If you're unfamiliar with the stream, I stream this on two channels. Uh, this goes out to the Virginia Tech University Libraries channel, which is VTUL Studios, as well as uh, my personal channel, which is Rogan27. Um, uh, let me go ahead and say hi to the people that are in chat. Uh, hello, Fluidan. Hello, Lord Portico. Um, and yes, the finding aid command should work on both channels, possibly. Uh, it, it's possible that viewers can't do the command on the library's channel. Uh, if any viewers want to give it a try, please do, and we'll see if it works. Um, also, hello, Key Squared. Uh, anyway, let me go ahead and get, get us started today. Um, thankfully, the meeting that I had that was coming up at when stream normally ends uh, is not happening today, so I don't have a hard stop today, uh, and if we go over a little, that is totally fine. Uh, but let me go ahead and start with what we always start with on this stream, which is the Land and Labor Acknowledgement from the University. Um, <clears throat> so, Virginia Tech acknowledges that we live and work on the Tudelo and Monacan people's homeland, and we recognize their continued relationships with their land, lands and waterways. We further acknowledge that legislation and practices like the Morrill Act of 1862 
enabled the Commonwealth of Virginia to finance and found Virginia Tech through the forced removal of Native nations from their lands, both locally and in Western territories. We understand that honoring Native peoples without explicit material commitments falls short of our institutional responsibilities. Through sustained, transparent, and meaningful engagement with the Tudelo and Monacan peoples and other Native nations, we commit to changing the trajectory of Virginia Tech's history by increasing Indigenous student, staff, and faculty recruitment and retention, diversifying course offerings, and meeting the growing needs of all Virginia tribes and supporting their sovereignty. We must also recognize that enslaved black people generated revenue and resources used to establish Virginia Tech and were prohibited from attending until 1953. Through Inclusive VT, the institutional and individual commitment to Ut Prosim that I may serve, in the spirit of community, diversity, and excellence, we commit to advancing a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive community. <clears throat> so, as always, I think it's important that we hear those words uh, every week before we dive into history, uh, which is fraught with institutional structures that do not support equitable treatment of uh, minority communities. So uh, the plan today is that we are going to look at the Blacksburg, Virginia Oddfellows records. And you may or may not know anything about the uh, Odd Fellows. Um, we'll get a little bit of history here, how about? Which, interestingly enough, the finding aid does not give a whole lot of history on the Odd Fellows. Um, hang on one second. Because I do have a resource for history on the Odd Fellows. I just need to actually find it because I didn't realize the finding aid didn't really have it. Um, here we go. If you want more information, hi Hannah. <laughs> I've had this hat for a while. I just uh, because of the green screen not necessarily liking my brown hat, I chose to wear this for the stream. Um, but I'm glad you like it. Uh, so there is a blog post I did back in 2017 um, about this collection in particular. Uh, with some historical information about the Odd Fellows, uh, I'm just going to grab that for the other stream as well. Um, anyway, how is everybody's Wednesday going? While I do this, if if you care to share, I would be happy to hear. Um, I wish I had gotten this part done ahead of time. But it's fine. We'll be there in just a second. I just want to make sure I get the information for both channels. All right, there we go on the library's channel. Um, a link to the blog post about the Grand United Order of Oddfellows, Tadmore Light, Tadmore Light Lodge, number 6184. Uh, <laughs> So, <clears throat> just adding category. Someday, Lord Portico, someday. Um, <coughs> so let me get you just some basic background information on uh, the Grand United Order of Odd Fellows. So here, here's how I introduced it in the blog post. If you've watched television or attended a movie in the last 50 to 60 years, you've probably seen a reference to Freemasonry or Masons. Uh, while the Masons have become a mythic symbol in popular culture that is often associated with conspiracy theories and the Illuminati, they originated, like many secret fraternal organizations, in a much more mundane environment, essentially as a guild or union and likely in the 14th century. 
Over the centuries, many similar organizations were formed or broke away from Freemasonry, and one such organization was the Grand United Order of Oddfellows. Uh, according to their organizational published history, the Oddfellows was formed as a fraternal society in similar fashion to other Masonic societies. Primary defend characteristic was its inclusivity. Anyone was welcome to join regardless of social status. Unfortunately, that inclusiveness led to a division in the order around the topic of race. In 1842, 1843 New York, an effort was launched by a group from the Mother AME Zion Church to found a chapter of the Grand United Order of Oddfellows in America. They petitioned the current existing Oddfellows Lodges in America, members of the Independent Order of Oddfellows, uh, but were denied because the petitioners were black. Uh, since one member of the church, Peter Ogden, was a member of the Grand United of a Grand United Order of Oddfellows Lodge in England, he set sail to secure a charter for a new lodge. Uh, on March 1st, 1843, the Philomathean Lodge number 646 of the Grand United Order of Oddfellows was established in New York. From that time on, the Grand United Order of Oddfellows in America became a fraternal organization with primarily, while not exclusively, black membership. Uh, so the local lodge here in Blacksburg, Virginia uh, was founded, I say in the blog post sometime in the early 1900s, likely around 1904. Um, I think we actually can do better than that today because I'm aware of additional information that just either I didn't know about or it did not register with me back when I wrote this blog post, um, which is we have a document from their 27th anniversary, which was <laughs> well, we'll figure it out when we're looking at the documents because I don't I know that there was a date associated with that, and with a 27th anniversary date, we can find out the date that they were founded. I just, it's not in the image that I had readily available. So, how about we start looking at documents? <laughs> Which is sort of what the archives is all about. Um, there's actually three boxes today. One of them is the large banker box, and the others are smaller boxes. Uh, there's no way we will get through all of this today. <clears throat> so, let's see what seems interesting. Payment records, not so much. Some correspondence. Payment records, receipts. I'm just going to pull out a few things that look interesting. Incidentally, if you're looking at the finding aid and you do see a folder title that sounds interesting to you, let me know and we will um, pull it out and look at it. Well, we'll start, we'll start with these. I've got three folders that I pulled to begin with. And we will find more as we go. over here. Make sure you all can see the documents that I've got. Lighting-wise today seems a little odd. Does that seem extra dark to you today? It seems extra dark to me. We're super brightly lit in here today. Why is that We'll discover it as we go. It does seem dark, yeah. Um, hmm. That is like extra, extra dark. Is there a filter or something on the scene? Let me check. I don't know why there would be. I haven't made any changes to the scene, but And 
indeed there is not, so... I'm going to see if the overhead lights can be adjusted, maybe. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's as good as it's gonna get from the overheads. I have a light on the camera itself, and that light is on, but does not really seem to be illuminating these quite in the way that they have been in the past. One more option. really bizarre. Did that make it worse? I don't understand. Well, that's going to be something for me to figure out for next time. Give me one second. I'm just going to adjust this to aim it a little bit. This may be the best I can do today. Uh, I have pulled over uh, one of the big floodlights and aimed it as directly at the documents as I can. It's also possible that the camera is going bad, uh, which if that's the case, we have options, just none that I was prepared to use today. So how about let's actually start looking at documents you should be able to see them even if they're not quite as bright as in previous streams. Um, first, we've got a postcard here. I'm gonna zoom in. It's a live stream, you never know what's gonna go wrong. So here we have a postcard. Uh, it was, um, let's see, the postmark was canceled, or the po postmark is from Herndon, Virginia, December 1909, uh, addressed to Mr. Granville Smith in Blacksburg. Uh, oh, this folder is just labeled Correspondence, 1908 to 1909. So uh, from, let's see, dated Herndon, Virginia, December 31st, 1909. Dear Brother Smith, please hand me by return mail the name of your express office. Yours fraternally, uh, A. J. Shirley. I think that is just asking for a new address. Let's see. Dues type stuff. Let's see. Um, oh, here's an interesting. What? Blacksburg, July 10th, 1908. Willie Williams. Uh, one. One chicken, one cake. Willie Young, one pig. Willie, I can't read that word. Hmm. 
It seems like receipts for stuff bought at a store. We're gonna learn about this organization through these documents. That's what we're gonna do. Vickers Switch, May 4th, 1908. Ray Anderson, dear brother, let me know at once when you all will re will turn out. If it is Sunday, let me know. Send me a new finance card. Let me hear from you at once. Your brother in TL. No. I mean, that looks like it should be an F, L, F, L, T. I don't know what those letters stand for in this context. Uh, David Scott, Vickers, Virginia. See, I was thinking it might be like TLL, but then it's not. Uh, TLL would be the Tadmore Light Lodge, but um, I don't know. Well, based on these first documents, I don't think the correspondence is going to be especially useful for us. So let's look at some of the other stuff uh, and we'll see what we've got. I think the correspondence would come in if we had better knowledge, better already existing knowledge um, about the organization and its members and then we could piece together what exactly was going on with um, the communications that they have. Uh, this one was in a mylar sleeve uh, because it is losing bits, uh, but the mylar gets uh, a little reflective for camera and we're already having lighting issues with the camera today, so I'm not going to use, not going to do that to you. Uh, what we have here is an application for membership. Uh, Grand United Order of Odd Fellows application for membership to the officers and members of Tadmore Light Lodge, number 6184, City of Blacksburg, State of Virginia. Greeting. I hereby respectfully solicit the honor of admission to your honorable body, promising a cheerful and faithful obedience to the laws, regulations, and ceremonies thereof. Enclosed, please find doctor's certificate and fee of $3.00. Signed, Plymouth Christian, uh, residence, Blacksburg, married or single, single, age, next birthday, uh, 28 September, 19.0.10. So uncertain if this means they will be 28 on September 19th, of 1910 or if they just put their birthday in, meaning September 28th, 1910 is their birthday, because of the odd um, punctuation here, the 19.0.10, it's sort of unclear as to whether they misinterpreted the prompt and put in their birthday as in day, month, year, or whether they put in their age and then indicated their birthday as September 19th, 1910, which would be um, the American order of things to put the month and then the day and then the year. We also don't have a date for this, so uh, just it's, it's not possible to know whether he was going to be turning 28 or whether this is September 28th, 1910. Just uh, there's two possible interpretations and we don't have enough information in just this document to, to figure out which is accurate. Um, and then uh, vouchers, looks like Washington Anderson possibly. I saw that too, Lord Portico, and indeed, it does indicate that a doctor's certificate was part of the application for membership. 
I do not know um, the purpose behind that. Uh, so if it said fluid and it didn't say TLL, because yeah, if it said TLL, I would I would think Tadmore Light Lodge. Um, but the letters on here, that is an F. I could see it being a T, but it's an it, it, it's mo more likely to be an F. This is definitely an L, and this is a T. So this is FLT. My guess is that it has something to do with the um, uh, some aspect of the secret fraternal nature of the organization, uh, and that those are initials for like organizational values, uh, because it says your brother in, and then it has those initials. And so I'm totally just basing this on my own personal experience with having been a member of a fraternity. Um, uh, it was a professional fraternity. Um, and that is, that is the way that a brother would greet another brother um, by your brother in and then initials for uh, like the motto of the fraternal organization. So that's my guess is that it's something in that vein. I just, I don't know for certain. Um, oh, the initials of Odd Fellows of the Odd Fellows Lodge are FLT, which stands for Friendship, Love, and Truth. The basic guides to live by. Thank you. So that does confirm uh, my thought that they were in some way related to the... Um, meaning within the organization. And yeah, in doing actual research, I would take the time to, to look that up if it was important uh, for me to know. Uh, for the stream, I try not to go looking stuff up on the internet uh, because it's not super engaging to watch somebody Google things. Um, Let's see. Proceedings of the 50th General Meeting Grand United Order of Odd Fellows held at the at Baltimore, Maryland, September 12th to 17th, 1910. Uh, I don't know that we necessarily want to read conference proceedings, but I mean, it starts off with a big list of delegates. Um, Looks like they started off with a, an address by the mayor of Baltimore. Yeah, there's a bunch of uh, transcribed speeches in here. I'm more interested in the local organization. Uh, bad internet research assistant. <laughs> I, I wouldn't say that you're a bad research assistant or that it's bad research when it is purely for personal informational purposes. Um, Because if it's just for your personal information, the level of um, the required level of accuracy and reliability for the information is uh, much lower than if it is for uh, like publication of an academic nature. Uh, the level of required reliability there is, is different. Um, we'll not be writing a treatise on this topic. Yeah. Uh, I really, like, I apologize for the weird lighting today. I, I think that our camera might be, I'm going to try one thing. You're going to lose picture on the, the table. Maybe? Yes. Okay. It took it a second. Um... 
I'm trying the age-old uh, method of turn it off and turn it on again. Um, in this case, by unplugging it and plugging it back in. Uh, just to see if it makes any difference to the video quality, um, the lighting of the document. It really didn't. I, um... Yeah. I don't know. I, I suspect that it might indeed be... Um, hang on one second. I, I don't know what's going on. Um, I lost chat, so everything is weird today, and I apologize. I'm just pulling up chat in a different way. Um... Oh, look. It doesn't look as bad there. Uh, I, I don't know if you lost the music. There's still music in my ears, but this is telling me that I have lost internet. Um, which... I'm hoping is not the case, but... Everything is fine. <laughs> Everything's weird today. It's totally how today and yesterday have gone for you. What's, what's funny is I'm not on my home setup, but my computer that runs the audio and everything else has decided that its ethernet connection doesn't exist. So that loses us captions. One, one moment. Uh,
Hi, I'm back. Hopefully you have music back. Um, I can uh, see chat again, so that's good. I do not know what happened, although I have a suspicion. Uh, brand new machine. I had not turned off, um, I had not shut off Wi-Fi, so I suspect that it had connected to Wi-Fi and lost the Wi-Fi connection uh, and therefore decided that it wasn't wanting to use Ethernet. Um, but I don't know if that's the case. Anyway, Wi-Fi's turned off. I unplugged and plugged back in the adapter that was allowing me to connect to the Ethernet, and suddenly I had Ethernet again. So, fingers crossed that I continue to be able to see you lovely chat. Also, really don't know what's up with the camera today. It is awful. What is it? Oh, oh, there's a setting. I see, I have discovered, there is a brightness setting on the camera itself. That I did not know existed. Okay, that, that seems a little too bright now, huh? <laughs> I'm just discovering all sorts of new things today after having physically moved lights so that they're now just right in my face. But, um, <laughs> too bright. It's, it's burning me. Um, payment records. I don't know if you've all noticed uh, with, you know, how dark all the images were. Uh, the holes in these documents. I assume there are people in chat who know where those holes came from. And rather than telling you, I'm going to ask you if anybody can tell me why every one of these things has a hole in it. And Key Squared got it in one. Uh, indeed, they were spiked. So this was, um, you've probably seen it in movies where uh, somebody who's doing paperwork, once they have finished with an item, they jam it onto a spike, a metal spike. And they'll have like a stack of documents that are all on this metal spike. And it was just, it, it's like having an outbox. Uh, like you've got stuff in your inbox and you've got stuff in your outbox, except instead of an outbox, it was a metal spike that you um, physically put the paper onto. Uh, it punched a hole in it, which was a surefire way to know that you had done it. Whereas like a modern inbox, outbox system where there are trays, if something gets put into your outbox by mistake, you don't have any way to know that it wasn't supposed to be there. Uh, whereas it's much harder to accidentally shove something down on a metal spike. <clears throat> Crimson permanent assurance. Broken paper on a spike to intimidate the other paper on your desk. <laughs> <coughs> um, let's see. So these are payment records. Not super interested in the payment records. Oh, here's, this one's kind of interesting. It's a receipt. Lovely printed receipt. March 25th, 1907, received from The Odd Fellows, uh, $2.50 on payment for lodge room. Oh, really only notable because it was interesting looking. Um, right, we're looking for other things. I'm gonna keep receipts, receipts, meeting minutes, meeting minutes might be good. Meeting minutes are very interesting. 
in that they are literally just a strip of paper. This is, this folder says meeting minutes 1910. And it is a torn out piece of a ledger. Uh, I know it's a ledger because the lines on the page, um, so we have brown ink lines going horizontally and a variety of red, pink ink lines in the vertical direction and the way that they are formatted on the page is pretty standard to a uh, old style ledgers. Um, <clears throat> Blacksburg, Virginia, June 21st, 1910. The lodge met and open in due form, the opening ode was sung and pray by William Green and business was Barg? It looks like B-A-R-R-E-D. Uh, barred on, it was more and second, it was move and second that we meet Friday night, the 24th. Money was... Collect on hall tax, $4.35. William Green fined 50 cents. I don't know why William Green was fined 50 cents, but apparently on June 21st, 1910, William Green was fined 20 or er, fined 50 cents. I think there are some better folders once we get a little bit further in. <clears throat> I just started at the beginning of the box, which has a lot of their financial records uh, that are quite mundane. So let me get past some of those and find something more enticing. Possibility. Got some books. A magazine. That sounds interesting. <clears throat> the ritual. Uh, Send annual dues. Circular. Checkbook stubs. Envelopes. There's a lot of receipts in here, let me tell you. If you meticulously go through them, you can probably figure out uh, basically everything that this organization was doing uh, from a general operations standpoint. Correspondence committee. Ooh, that one looks good. I'm just pulling things that sound enticing at the moment. Uh, and we're going to find we have a couple issues of the Odd Fellows Journal newspaper. That seems interesting. I want to make sure we get some Household of Ruth stuff as well. So I'm, I'm kind of skipping through a few of these folders looking to see if I spot those. I think they might actually be in a different box and I will check the finding aid shortly. Um, but let's look at the fold let's look at the folders that I have already pulled. <sighs> What's really silly is like when it's a collection that I have zero experience with at all, um, I feel like I struggle less. And, and I have some familiarity with this collection. I know there's really interesting things in it. I just don't know where, they're at, where they are. Um, and I didn't look ahead of time, and now I'm like, the 
the things we've been looking at aren't super interesting. There are more interesting things. And, and I don't know if it shows, but I'm just like, I don't know. My energy is different with this collection than with ones that I've never seen before. Uh, so this is the ritual of the Grand United Order of Odd Fellows, book second, composed of rules, laws, and regulations relating to obligations and installations. Uh, also the rules, laws, and regulations relating to lodges of instruction, lectures, signs, passwords, and tests, as laid down in the English work. Published by the Committee of Management, Manchester, England, and American Works, as presented by MVP brother Joseph C. Bustel of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. The whole diligently revised and arranged under the supervision of the Subcommittee of Management of MVP R. Fawcett, Grand Master of the Grand United Order of Oddfellows in America, and published by authority of the Subcommittee of Management for the Use of the Order in America, reprinted 1914. Um, so this is available in our collections as a document that anybody can come in and look at. Uh, copies of, so this is the ritual from 1914. Uh, it looks like we also have book first from 1916. Um, and if you're at all familiar with fraternal organizations, so uh, fraternities, sororities, things like that, the ritual is generally uh, part of the secret portion of that organization. Um, so out of respect, I will not be sharing the entire ritual on stream. Uh, I, don't, I don't know that it's a huge issue. You can probably find the entire thing online if you really want to know their entire ritual. Um, owing to the fact that clearly it's available in the public realm, uh, being available from the archives, but just, you know, out of respect for this organization that was primarily in the U.S., uh, or is primarily in, in the U.S., um, a, a, an organization for black people, um, this is not my fraternity, and I, I want to respect them and uh, not divulge their secrets. So... <laughs> not gonna cover very much in here. I want to just look and see if there's something that seems like it would be okay to share. But like these lectures, lecture in the third degree, etc., those seem like they're probably um, explaining the secrets of the organization, uh, explaining the meaning of any symbols, stuff like that. Those are things that I don't necessarily want to share on stream. Um, while they might be incredibly interesting, those are the things, like Noble, Noble Grand's test, those are things that seem um, disrespectful to share. So I won't be doing it. Uh, but I will look at stuff like the preface stuff that talks about rules of the lodge stuff like that that i will um i don't, I don't see a problem sharing that this book must be kept in the hall under the charge of the acting past noble father rules for the lodge of instruction one lodges of instruction should be held in each district or lodge not less than once a quarter if possible monthly Two, district lodges of instruction are to be presided over by the district master and the district deputy master. When held in private lodges, they must be presided over by a past grand master or the past noble father of the lodge. Three, members are entitled to the first degree one month after initiation, and no member can be nominated to any office in his lodge except that of supporting officer until he has passed the first degree, nor to the office of vice grand until he has passed the second degree, nor of the noble grand until he has passed the third degree. The officers of the lodge of instruction shall consist of the acting past noble father who shall preside assisted by his predecessor and two past noble fathers or two brothers of the degree acting as warden and guardian. The past noble father shall occupy the chair of the noble grand, a brother past noble father, 
shall sit opposite or move to suit his convenience with the brother warden on his right, the brother guardian at the door, and the brothers at, on either side between the past noble fathers. So this is setting up uh, the physical layout. Uh, it sets up responsibilities of who is responsible for doing what or filling which roles. Um, and then uh, the physical layout of where they need to be located in the room where the ritual is going to take place. Uh, the officers and brothers shall wear the regalia belonging to their degree. When no degree is being conferred, the signs, passwords, tests, and ceremonies shall be practiced, that the brothers may be, become perfect in their knowledge and use. Uh, so if, no, if nobody's actually being granted a degree, in, in the ritual, they're doing the ritual just to do the ritual and get practice at doing it so that they do it well. Um, and then we start getting into the script. Um, the noble grand, vice grand, and officers of a lodge of instruction must be past noble fathers in their respective lodges. Past noble father, guardian. Tile the door. Warden, examine the room and see that no brother is present who has not passed. And then the warden examines the room and reports. And so, like, literally that is the beginning of the ritual, is check to make sure that nobody's here who can't see the ritual. Which seems like a great place to stop looking, because if... If you have to have passed in order to be present, I probably shouldn't share that on stream because that would be disrespectful. But we do have this book from two years later that is book first. That was book second that we were looking at. I do not know the difference. Ritual of the Grand United Order of Odd Fellows, Book First. Composed of opening, closing, and initiation ceremonies and regulations, as laid down in the English work published by the Committee of Management, Manchester, England, and American work as presented by MVP brother Joseph C. Bustle of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. The whole diligently revised and arranged under the supervision of the Subcommittee of Management by MVP R. Fawcett, Grand Master of the Grand United Order of Oddfellows in America, published by authority of the Subcommittee of Management for the Use of the Order in America, 1916 edition. Um, printed by Oddfellows Journal, Washington, D.C. Oddfellows Journal is the newspaper that we have a couple copies of that we'll look at in just a second here. Uh, but this one actually includes a map uh, letting you know so how to set up the initiation or other rituals. So um, this is it's the lodge room, the asterisks, these four asterisks here, it says settees for members in the key below. Uh, apparently the guardian goes here. This appears to be the door to the room, possibly. I'm not certain. Uh, the warden goes here. These are actually uh, sort of guardian, warden, treasurer, secretary, etc. These roles are um, fairly common in fraternal organizations to have roles that are given those titles. Uh, I imagine the, they probably serve similar purposes in various organizations, uh, but probably also somewhat dissimilar in cases. Um, chaplain Four, five, and six, treasurer, pass, P secretary, and E secretary. Not certain uh, what the abbreviations are there. Um, seven, VG and supporters. Uh, <coughs> I don't. I'm sure we just saw this term, VG, I'm not certain. Um, I know NG was noble, grand. I don't know what, vice grand. 
So Vice Grand End supporters at seven, Noble Grand End supporters at eight. Um, <clears throat> Nine is all the way over here in the corner. Um, ten noble fathers and past noble fathers. Eleven past noble fathers and distinguished visitors. Twelve is a sacred altar. Thirteen Chesterfield. I'm unfamiliar with a with a piece of furniture called a Chesterfield. Uh, at least nothing is springing to mind, but 13 is some sort of piece of furniture called a Chesterfield. Uh, this is not the kind of guardian that rises and has to fight off nightmares with magic. No, no, it is not. A sofa. A Chesterfield is a sofa. Got it. Okay. Yeah, if you do a quick internet search of just Chesterfield furniture, you can get some images. Um, kind of a, a two cushion sofa. Um, seems to have a very particular uh, pattern and look to it. <clears throat> Thank you, Key Squared. Uh, let's see, 14, fields of prep, fields or preparation room. 14, 15, regalia and reception room, and 16, past noble guardians room. <coughs> Form of opening to be observed by every lodge in the order. And this, this page seems well used. Actually, this entire book seems rather well used. Noble Grand, officers take your stations. Guardian, close the door. Warden, examine the room. And if there be any stranger present, inform me thereof. Right supporter, state your duty. The answer to that is apparently to support you, to officiate in your absence, and to assist in opening the lodge. Um, left supporter, state your duty, to assist you and to assist you in closing the lodge. And then warden, state your duty, uh, to arrange everything requisite for opening the lodge, to keep it comfortable and in order, to execute your commands, and to see that all things are put away at the closing of the lodge, and to report to you any loss or damage that may have been sustained. So uh, this is, they're sharing all of their roles. I'm going to assume we're good with knowing what the roles are. Uh, let's see. One turns up in one of the Hitchhiker's Guide sequels. Interesting. Let's see, Wardens. Oh, yeah, Past Noble Grand, state your duty. Uh, to guard the door against strangers, to have the password from each member or your consent for his admission, and to prevent anyone from listening to what is going on in the lodge. Inside Guardian, state your duty in the Lodge. To assist the outside Guardian in the discharge of his duty and to officiate for him in his absence and to receive from each member the password before admitting him. Elective Secretary, explain your duty. My duty is to minute the transactions of the business in a true and intelligible way and take account of all warrants drawn and cash receipts of the meeting. Permanent Secretary, uh, receive the financial contributions of the brethren and keep a fair and impartial account betwixt every brother and the lodge to keep the accounts clear and intelligible and to balance such accounts when required by uh, the officiant or the lodge. <coughs> Applies for the role of left supporter. 
Uh, Vice Grand is to act in conjunction with the officiant, uh, assist in enforcing the laws during lodge hours, and give their charge on the initiation of members. Vice Grand, examine your supporters. Oh, wow. The Vice Grand's right supporter to support you in the same way as my worthy brother, the left supporter, to the noble Grand, and to officiate for you in his absence. The left supporter to support you in the same manner as your right supporter. Noble Grand. Worthy past noble father, vice grand officers and brethren, I trust that you will be attentive to the business of the evening. I shall endeavor to act accordingly to law, to judge impartially of every transaction, and I trust that each will be candid and prudent, as on these principles depend our pleasure and comfort. Brother Chaplain will, will pray. Uh, and then there's a prayer. A rather lengthy prayer, it seems. Uh, and then it goes into the actual opening of their stuff. And I'm not going to, again, share details of their rituals. Um, the beginning of that one consisted of formalities of everybody stating what they do, what their roles are. Uh, and so f for that, I felt like, you know, this is safe to share without offending, but <clears throat> don't really want to dive into the intimate particulars on stream. If you are interested uh, in knowing the particulars of the rituals from 1914 to 1916 that we were just looking at, you can always contact the archives and we can get you a copy of what's in those books uh, because they are publicly available. So here we have... Um, The King's Messenger, a magazine from October 1916. This is volume 12, number 10. Registered for transmission by Canadian Magazine Post. Uh, cost was one, ha one halfpenny. Uh, published by the Society for the Propagation of the Gospel in Foreign Parts. The first picture shows a country Chinese woman, a city lady, would not have such large sleeves. For the latest fashions, order very tight sleeves and tighter, even shorter, and tighter, even shorter coats. Also, the trimming over the shoulders is quite old-fashioned and would only be worn in the country. This lady is in mourning, as shown by her white shoes and ankle bands. But the bound feet would be the same practically anywhere in China, except, of course, amongst the Manchu people, who live chiefly in Peking. Uh, the little girls begin to have their feet... Uh, so it talks a little bit about foot binding. This is actually surprisingly uh, interesting insofar as the language used to describe the image and to state the specifics of why they say that this is a a woman from the country uh, by analyzing the fashion of what she's wearing is surprisingly not belittling and not, it doesn't seem to be uh, necessarily based in stere stereotype. They have particular evidence and have stated uh, analytically the particulars of the fashion that indicate that this person is likely from the country surprisingly unbiased in how it represented that information for an item from 1916 um, <clears throat> I, I don't really particularly want to read the information about foot binding on stream but uh, I imagine that it will become more judgmental once we get in, once once it moves into that. Um, <coughs> let's see, girl with load of hay. I, I, what is this magazine?
This girl lives in the country. She is burnt so brown because she is out in the sun all day. Oh, you had such a good start, magazine. The weather must be nice and warm for she has not her winter clothes on and has had to put a bit of blue stuff over her head for a hat. Those two bundles of hay are not very light. She has fixed them on a pole about six feet long and carries it on her shoulder. We see girls like this on the hills near Peking uh, where the missionaries have a little house of rest called S. Hillary's. Uh, there are many Buddhist temples on the hills and the Buddhist mon monks own nearly all the land about here and let it out to poor people. This makes it very hard for the people to come and listen to the missionaries teaching uh, for as soon as the landlords hear of it, they will come and threaten to turn them out of their homes. So though the missionaries go to the hills every summer, the country people have not shown much wish to become Christians. Is this, is this a missionary magazine? Is that what this is? I'm very curious. I know nothing about it. I've not heard of it before. Um, but that seems to likely be the case. <clears throat> oh, yay. Uh, you may see um, objectionable terminology in the printed word from this magazine from 1916. Uh, communications in regard to the magazine, uh, that gives an address. <laughs> okay, I, sorry. This just st strikes me as, as humorous, somewhat humorous. Um, <clears throat> so this is, this is very clearly uh, the King's Messengers. Um, I had wondered at the banner illustration here with the cross. Uh, this is definitely a magazine for missionaries. Uh, I, I would have to do some research, look it up. I'm sure I could find information about this magazine. Um, I just find it very interesting that this magazine for missionaries ends with three pages of advertisements for products. HP sauce, British made, just a few drops, that's all. And you will be delighted with the flavor of the delicious Asian fruits and spices perfectly blended. Be sure you ask for HP sauce at all grocers. <coughs> Oteen, face cream. Sunlight soap. They have to pay for the magazine somehow. You are correct. It just, the whole magazine is there with no ads and then three pages of ads at the end, I was not anticipating their um, sudden appearance. Dr. J. Collis Brown's Chlorodyne, the reliable family medicine, cuts short attacks of spasms, hysteria, palpitation, a true palliative of in gout, rheumatism, neuralgia, toothache, acts like a charm in diarrhea, colic, and other bowel complaints, the best remedy known for coughs, Colds, asthma, bronchitis. Always ask for a Dr. Collis Brown. We, we last summer, we had an entire month where we looked at um, patent medicines. Uh, and this definitely seems like a patent medicine. It's not one that I don't think we talked about Dr. J. Collis Brown's Chlorodyne last year, but um, that is definitely an ad for a patent medicine that claims that it cures everything. Uh, the teeth ad is hilarious. Old artificial teeth bought. Persons wishing to receive full value should apply to the actual manufacturers instead of to provincial buyers. If, fo followed, if forwarded by post, value per return or offer made. Mrs. Browning, 
Uh, Chief Office is 63 Oxford Street, London, established 100 years. We will buy your old artificial teeth. Pioneer work in Algoma? No idea. D and S, Cocoa Essence, British made, six and a half D. Do I have any, any uh, Brits with me in chat today? Um, Understanding old British money. Oh my gosh, you're kidding me. Hang on. So, uh, the D is for shillings. Um, the old, the old currencies of pounds, shillings, and pence. Sorry, the D is pence. Uh, pounds, shillings, and pence um, was occasionally written LSD and pronounced LSD, uh, which uh, just struck me as odd, um, especially considering this is D and S, uh, which would be um, pence and shillings. Uh, so I'm sure that they meant it that way in titling their business D and S Cocoa Essence. Um, on the other hand, you do buy artificial teeth if they are gold. They make good scrap metal and end up getting recycled. That, I mean, that makes sense, Hannah. So this is six and a half shillings per one quarter pound tin sold by all grocers. <clears throat> Apparently it is manufactured by a tea company. Well, that was interesting. Not really about the Odd Fellows, but it was part of their collection, so. Um, what we have next is Oddfellows Journal newspaper, March 1st, 1934. And indeed, it is a newspaper. Uh, we'll hold it up. You can kind of see. Oddfellows Journal. We'll raise this up a little bit. Try and get more of it on the screen here. Volume 37, number 8, Washington, D.C., Thursday, March 1st, 1934, cost of $1 per year. All right, let's, let's see what we got. Uh, urges attendance at BMC. Grandmaster Edward H. Morris makes appeal for delegates. To the odd fellows and sisters of the household of Ruth, as well as the past grandmasters and patriarchs of the Grand United Order of Odd Fellows. The BMC, the Grand Household of Ruth, the past Grand Masters Conference and the Grand Patriarchy will assemble in the city of Washington, D.C. on Monday, August 13th, A.D. 1934. Go to your lodges, go to your households of Ruth, and urge upon them to send a delegate. This ought not be a matter of great expense. There can be found in most every lodge and household of Ruth some brother or sister who will be pleased to be a delegate, even though you pay but a part of the cost of the trip. Start now and see if you cannot, by entertainment, small savings, and in other ways that will not be a burden, raise enough money to help send a delegate. 
your lodge and household of Ruth ought to know how the affairs of your order have been conducted during the past four years. Come and tell us what is needed in your lodge, your city, and your district. This is your order. Come and help manage it. Come and find out if the best that could have been done has been done. Come and find fault and criticize if you must, but come. Come and talk, come and listen, come and sing, come and praise, and come and condemn. Come and look, come and parade, come and see. There will be room for you, there will be time for you. Come and say your say and take your part. The order is calling. Won't you come? Fraternally yours, Edward H. Morris, Grand Master. That has got to be one of the most unintentionally entertaining requests for members to come to a national conference. Just the whole section at the end, come and talk, come and listen, come and sing, come and praise, come and condemn. Just like, just come and take part. Just be a part of the organization. You, you just, just get here and, and be a part of it. If, if you hate everything about the organization and you're angry that you joined, come and tell us. Like, and, and I get it. Uh, knowing a little bit about the financial cost of organizing a large national conference, um, attendance matters. Like, putting together a large national conference for any organization, a any large event that's going to take place at a conference center, um, if you don't, if, if, if people don't come, then you spend a bunch of money and you're, it's a big loss to the organization. And when it's a membership organization like this, they likely charge money for you to attend the conference because that's one of the main ways that they make up their operating budget for the year. Um, so that was just a really interesting uh, exhortation. <clears throat> So this is just communication within the organization. We have one here, Seeking Missing Relatives, Ringgold, Louisiana. One sister, Pinkney Crawford, was a member of Rise and Shine Household of Ruth number 5724. She died here May 9th, 1933, leaving 10 children. Two of these children are missing and have not been heard from since her death. The names of the missing children are Thomas Crawford and Chance Hightower. It is important that they be located in order to settle decedent's estate. Anyone knowing the whereabouts of these two persons will confer a favor by sending the information to or have them communicate with the undersigned Cordelia Johnson, Ringgold, Louisiana. I wonder if they ever found them. Ooh. I don't want to do much on the inside here because I'm not set up to use the overhead today and therefore I, I, I can't really lay it out flat uh, but I thought it was interesting here to have uh, Peter Ogden, the founder of the Grand United Order of Odd Fellows in America. Um, there's a whole section here. Annals of Peter Ogden. Salient features in the life of the founder of the order, Peter Ogden, as an historical character and in relation to the establishment of the Grand United Order of Odd Fellows in America became conspicuous near the close of the year 1842 when he arrived in New York from Liverpool, England on the ship Patrick Henry, on which he was engaged as steward. Of him, prior to this event, 
Not is known, save that he was an odd fellow, having been initiated in Victoria Lodge Number 448, Grand United Order of Odd Fellows, Liverpool, England, and that he was a member of the past Grand Master's Council. The date of his birth and knowledge of his antecedents are yet in the darkness of obscurity. What knowledge of Peter Ogden is now available in orderly form is to be found in the history and manual prepared, for, prepared by former Grand Secretary Charles H. Brooks and published in 1902, but now out of print. Although the most diligent investigation has been made, nothing concerning Ogden's life prior to 1842 has been revealed other than as above stated. When the matter of establishing Ogden Day was being considered by the BMC, which met in Atlantic City, N.J. Judge Mifflin W. Gibbs, who died in Little Rock, Arkansas in 1915, at that time the only living contemporary of Ogden was present, and even he was unable to add anything to what was then known of Ogden. On Ogden's arrival in New York, at the particular time aforementioned, he learned of the effort of the members of Philomathean Institute, a literary and social organization, to be chartered as, an, as a lodge of odd fellows and how they had been rebuffed by certain odd fellow organizations, so called, then operating in Pottsville, Pennsylvania and New York City. It was on learning these facts that Peter Ogden offered his services to negotiate with the fraternity in England, and particularly with his own lodge, Victoria Number 448, to the end sought by the men in Philomathean Institute. As a result of Ogden's negotiations, Philomathean Institute became Philomathean Lodge Number 646, New York, New York, May 1st, 1843, and that date, March, or sorry, March 1st, the date on which the Grand United Order of Oddfellows in America was founded, was designated by the BMC as Ogden Day, in commemoration of the man and brother who bore the name. Interesting. I just, the image caught my eye as something interesting to look at. And that also published newspaper document uh, stating information that is not independently verified about the life of the founder of the organization in the United States. Um, so that would definitely not be a primary source, despite it being a newspaper. Uh, that is a secondary source because it is information that is um, being reported by the newspaper, but based on uh, essentially hearsay. Uh, it's it's relating what is known, but not citing any sources. So definitely secondary. Um, I don't often do like primary versus secondary on the stream, but that seemed like a proper occasion to do so. Uh, let me look at box two and see what's in box two. <clears throat> Miscellaneous. That is my least favorite folder title. That is the most useless folder title. Can anyone tell me what's in this folder based on the title of miscellaneous? The only answer you can give is miscellany. <clears throat> I have no idea whether that was a title given to this folder by the archivist who processed the collection or whether it was, whether the collection came in folders and that it was already labeled as miscellaneous, in which case we would keep that name. Um, let's see, this is a stationary ad for lithograph blotters. <coughs> this one's neat. I'm gonna zoom in a little bit because it's cute. Um, it seems like we have a number of advertisements in this folder.
from old to new with any shoe. Kib Wade Shoe Hospital. See Kib, the shoe doctor, Blacksburg, Virginia, box 353. The images are like, um, not, not doctor, they're like illustrations of a cobbler. Uh, there's a rundown shoe that walks in and walks out looking newer but still using a cane. Let's see, bank loans. The lid to a cigar box. interior lid of a cigar box and the exterior lid of the cigar box. Uh, let's see. Hughes the tailor. So a number of ads in here. Um, page from a magazine that is unidentified, which I'm guessing is why it ended up in the mis mis miscellaneous folder. It's really even hard to say that word for me, sorry. There's a lot of like scrap papers that were in this miscellaneous folder, so. <laughs> Eat a plate of clover ice cream every day. Clover Creamery Company in Roanoke, Virginia. <coughs> hmm. All right. Let's see what else is in here. Dues records, membership ribbons. That sounds interesting. Ritual cards, gospel hymns. Thanksgiving service program, the anniversary announcement. Most of this box is actually more interesting than most of the first box was. Uh, give me one second to put all of this stuff back in the folder and we'll take a look at the next folder. And again, if anyone watching uh, wants to point out a specific folder on the finding aid that you're interested in, um, do let me know in the chat and I'd be happy to pull it out and take a look at it. Um, you can find the finding aid at the link that will appear in chat right there. Thanks, Portico. <clears throat> that was a dues folder. We've looked at dues folders. They were not super interesting. This one is membership ribbons and an odd fellow's badge. <coughs> um, let's go ahead and take it out of the mylar so you can see it better. So this is a membership ribbon. You can see at the top it says member. Uh, Let's see what we can make out. In memoriam, Tadmore Light Lodge number 6184, Grand United Order of Odd Fellows, G-U-O of O-F, uh, with their crest, which is mostly faded off. Um, and then you have G-U-O of O-F, Blacksburg, Virginia. I don't know what they're in memoriam of, but on the back side, we also have another ribbon here, Tadmore Light Lodge, number 6184, Grand United Order of Odd Fellows, Blacksburg, Virginia. You can sort of see the um, crest a little bit better there. 
not, not so well on this ribbon. There might be some other things that show it off better. In fact, one of the other ribbons that's in better condition shows it better. <clears throat> Objects like this end up in, in the collections, um, but as we're not a museum, we are in archives, we primarily look for papers and written documents and things like that. Um, and so if the collection was like a couple of papers and mostly stuff like this, it wouldn't necessarily be a collection that we would take in. That also doesn't mean that we wouldn't take it, it's just that uh, it, we're much more likely to take a collection if it is um, papers, writings, things like that, uh, than if it is objects. Um, <clears throat> because our mission as an archives is more document focused, uh, whereas a museum would have more of a object focus. <clears throat> so here we have the FLT again. Um, interesting, it's so it's really faded. I can barely see it. Uh, there's no way you're gonna see it on the camera, but it, this is uh, T-A-D-M-O, Tadmo Lodge, number 6184. Um, an abbreviation for Tadmore Light Lodge, apparently. Tadmo Lodge. A red and black ribbon. Uh, the others was blue and white. I don't know the significance of the colors in this organization. Often fraternities will have specific colors uh, or fraternal organizations will have specific colors that have special meaning for them. Um, I do not know <clears throat> if blue and yellow red and black, and then there's one coming up that's green. Uh, I don't know if there's specific meaning to those um, colors. We have got another of those in memoriam ribbons. You can sort of see the crest here. It's still, it's not in the best of definition on the ribbon. Looks like there's an eye with rays coming down from it. There's somebody over here holding a scale. Um, it looks like this, possibly the sun. And then there's a moon surrounded by stars. I can't make out what the motto is on the ribbon here at the bottom from, the, from this ribbon. Uh, I'm sure that information is elsewhere in this collection. <coughs> The last ribbon or badge that is in here, oh no, the badge is right there. So this, the last ribbon in here is a green one with a star, Tadmore Light, Tadmo Lodge. <coughs> I'm guessing these are probably rank within their structure. Like uh, the, there was the red one, there's this green one, I don't know for certain, but that's my guess, is that it's going to be uh, an indication of their rank within the organization. The others were membership ribbons. These ones are not. Um, but as, as I have not read their ritual, I do not know the meanings uh, and don't know if they are, as I suspect, rank associated. And then we have this badge. Um, looks like a button. Only more of like a keychain style rather than like a pin on button. Um, I'm gonna zoom in so that you can get a good look at it. Uh, so we have the abbreviation G-U-O of O-F, uh, and you can see, interestingly enough, uh, considering that in, the, in uh, the United States, this organization was primarily an organization for black men, um, 
all of the individuals depicted in the image are white. Um, I see some religious imagery. It looks like maybe Mary and Jesus over on the left-hand side. Uh, there's some tall ships uh, in the background. Um, I definitely see a lion and a young person, or a younger person, um, uncertain. There's a person sitting with a lion over here on the right. In the middle is a woman in very regal uh, dress holding a scales and appears to be holding a, an o oval shield. Um, I, I, trying to pick out the heraldry on that shield and make sense of it um, is probably something you can do, could do. There's two fields of blue and two fields of red. There's not sufficient detail to know specifically what the, what the emblems are on the different fields, but with some general descriptors, uh, you could probably figure out what that heraldry is for. <coughs> Uh, on the back, it says uh, J.L.B. Forster. Books, cards, badges. Uh, so I'm guessing that is where... I'm guessing that this shop had the badge at some, t some point and um, somebody purchased it from there. Um, it, Grand United Order of Oddfellows over the edge here, America. Uh, so not even a properly centered um, button because part of the text got folded over onto the edge. Interesting, I don't know a whole lot about this badge um, or the specific symbology involved. That would be a, an interesting thing to research. Flooding company brochures, that's brochures for the ribbons that we just saw. Ritual cards, let's look at the ritual cards here. Let's see what we got. Um, <clears throat> so we read a little bit at, of the very beginning of the ritual uh, that defined people's role. Uh, that's as far as we went into the rituals because I want to respect like the particular mysteries of the organization and not necessarily share those on stream even though anybody can come to the archives and take a look at those books and read entirely cover to cover the ritual if you so desire um, <clears throat> but these cards would be for members who needed a memory aid for their part in the ritual So the noble grand is the person who's officiating the ritual. And this is essentially their entire script on a card. Officers, take your respective stations. Guardian, close the door. Warden, examine the room. And if there be any stranger present, inform me thereof. Right supporter, state your duty. Left supporter, state your duty. Outside gar warden, outside guardian, etc., etc. Worthy past noble grand, vice grand, officers and brethren, I trust that you will be attentive to the business of the evening. I shall endeavor to act according to the law, to judge impartially of every transaction, and I trust that each will be candid and prudent, as on these principles depend our pleasure and comfort. Outside guardian, take your station. Officers and breth brethren, be standing and uncovered and assist me and my right supporter to open the lodge. I declare this lodge duly opened. Secretary, I will thank you to call the officers' names and to read the min minutes of the lodge meeting. So, <clears throat> this would be a rotating role. This would be uh, like somebody 
somewhat senior in the organization. They've probably been to the ritual multiple times. <coughs> I mean, they would have been through the ritual multiple times, but that doesn't mean that they're going to remember their part. And it's essentially a large stage production with amateur actors um, that is done not on a stage. Uh, and so having a, a card like this as an aid to memory makes a lot of sense. And then you've got two others here. You've got the Vice Grand and the left supporter to the Vice Grand. So the Vice Grand, uh, when the Noble Grand gets to Vice Grand, state your duty in the Lodge, they have the exact wording of what they're supposed to say in response. My duty is to act in conjunction with you to assist you in enforcing the laws during the Lodge hours and to give my charge on the initiation of members. Um, <clears throat> and then they also have two people, a right and left supporter of their own, that they query as to what their duty is. And then we have the card for the left supporter to the Vice Grand, uh, who responds to support you in the same manner as your right supporter and to officiate occasionally for you in his absence. Um, Portico, I'm not certain. I, based on the roles defined here and sort of the things that are said, it does seem like this could very easily be uh, the opening ritual for just every meeting. Um, I don't know. It seemed to me, it seemed to me from the ritual book itself that it's probably more likely that it is, uh, for more special occasions like Ogden Day or when somebody is advancing in rank or, uh, new initiations or things like that. And that that would be the only time that the formal opening would happen. Um, but I can't be certain because... I have not specifically read through uh, all of their ritual, and not being a member myself, I don't know. <clears throat> so the next folder is five copies of a book called Gospel Hymns. Numbers five and six combined. It tries to imagine doing something similar for every meeting. Yeah, I. It, it, just for general business, it seems uh, a bit too much. But that doesn't mean that... It doesn't mean it wasn't done or wasn't supposed to be done for general business. Uh, one argument in favor of having that level of ceremony for regular meetings is to impart upon general business uh, more weight and more um, import. Uh, so to make general business meetings feel important. Uh, whereas if you don't have ceremony around the general business meeting, it's really easy to just not give it the same sort of respect that you do the rest of the organization. So it's entirely possible that that was a formal opening to every meeting. Um, I just, I don't know. So let's see, by Ira D. Sankey, James McGranahan, and George C. Stebbins. Words only. It's five cents for a hundred copies in paper, or 10 cents for a hundred copies in cloth, and this one is bound in cloth. So this is the more ex the, the more um, expensive one. It is stamped on the inside uh, by the YMCA of Blacksburg, Virginia, which was a very prominent organization um, in town uh, and at the university, um, Young Men's Christian Association, YMCA. Uh, if you were not aware that YMCA stood for Young Men's Christian Association, now you are. Um, So a variety of, these are just, just words, uh, and they are very religious in nature, gospel hymns. 
<clears throat> whole book of them. Um, five copies. I wouldn't be surprised if they occasionally sang just gospel hymns at events or meetings. Uh, I don't know for certain. We would, we could probably check the minutes and see if there's any mention of singing hymns, but five copies of the books in their stuff. Also, they're a community organization. You recognized a couple of the songs. Um, they're a community organization, so anything uh, community related, like we saw grocery, rece grocery receipts earlier. Um, essentially, uh, while yes, they were a secret fraternal organization um, in the style of like the Masons, uh, Freemasons. Um, they were also, they functioned as a mutual aid organization. So if you remember a couple weeks ago, we looked at Blacksburg Community Chest, uh, or sorry, Blacksburg, um, I forget the name, uh, but a, a Blacksburg, the Blacksburg Federation or something like that. Uh, wow, I can't believe I forgot the name. Um, which was an organization for white men and white families that was a mutual aid organization that ran community chest fundraisers during the uh, Great Depression. And this organization in Blacksburg served the same kind of function during the Great Depression for the black community here in Blacksburg. Uh, so while the Blacksburg Community Federation was operating for the betterment of the community and was um, working to pool together funds to take care of people who were struggling economically uh, during the Depression. All of their charity and all of their fundraising and all of their mutual aid benefit was for the white community. And despite all of their altruistic language, they never gave a thought to supporting the black community. Um, the Grand United Order of Odd Fellows Lodge here in town and the Household of Ruth here in town would have served that purpose. The mutual aid uh, community center uh, helping families who are down on their luck type of support during the 30s, um, this would have been the organization that did that for the black families in the area. So this document here, this is a, let's see, clearance cards as member credentials is what it is labeled as. Uh, Grand United Order of Odd Fellows. Um, <clears throat> We get a little bit better of the crest here. Still not great. Still really hard to figure out what exactly is on this crest. Uh, Amicita Amor Veritas. Um, what were the... Love and Truth Amicita. Sorry, my Latin is very, very rusty. Okay. Friendship, thank you. Of course, of course. Silly me. Um, so yes, uh, friendship, love, and truth is what is on the banner or the ribbon at the bottom. Um, this is amazing and hilarious and I love it. And I don't know if I can zoom in far enough for you to see it, uh, but I am going to try. Let's get it in the camera properly for you here uh, because look at the sun. Yes, the three Latin words for FLT, Lord Portico. 
two weeks ago, it was the National Grange of the Order of Patrons of Husbandry. Yes, um, and that was that was yet another organization of similar purpose. Um, but the Blacksburg Community Federation is the one that I was thinking of that had specifically the community chest fundraisers. Um, <clears throat> so in the image here, uh, uh, with their crest, you can see there's the person on the left holding um, a scales. I think they may also have some sort of staff in their right hand. I can't really make that out. Um, the person over on the right has a sickle uh, as well as a torch or staff of some sort. Um, in the center appears to be a building in the distance. I'm uncertain what that is. Um, and I can't really make out what this is at the very top center here. Um, there's a sun, what appears to be clouds, and a moon. The moon is surrounded by stars. The sun has two eyes, a nose, and a little smile. which is just adorable and amazing. I'm sure it's supposed to, like, because it's so small, it's supposed to be this, the, the sun that's over here on the right. It's supposed to be that, but it's just so small that it's just two dots, or three dots and a little bit, a little line. Um, it looks like a, a cute little, like, like a child drew a sun and put a face on it. Um, I'm absolutely certain it's meant to evoke this image here of the sun with a face. Um, I just, I'm amazed at, because I've zoomed in quite far. In reality, this is very small and you can barely see that there is a face on that sun. Anyway, I just, I had to show the face because the detail and it's adorable, cute little detail. To all whom it may concern greeting, we the undersigned acting officers of blank lodge number blank GUO of OF do hereby certify that the bearer blank is a member of our lodge. Uh, he has been a regular and worthy member for more years than blank, has paid all dues and demands uh, to this lodge and will be financial until the blank next ensuing. At the request of the above named brother blank, we have at a regular lodge meeting held the blank day of blank granted this clearance card and we hereby recommend him to all the fraternity throughout the world as a brother worthy of their regards. In witness whereof, we have subscribed names and affixed the seal of our lodge. This blank day of blank, 19 o blank. Uh, yeah, so this is basically, um, if somebody was going to be traveling, uh, they're a member of the local lodge, and they're, say, going to the national convention, going to an international convention, uh, moving, and wanting to be introduced to the local lodge at their destination. That is the purpose that this card would give. No, this document was not prepared for Y2K. It was not prepared for 1910. Oh wow, look at the time. I just saw what time it is. We have not looked <clears throat> at like anything from the household of Ruth at all. Um, you know what? If you all are open to it, like, I don't know how interesting you found all this. We've done a number of these uh, uh, sort of mutual aid and fraternal organizations. 
Um, and we've looked at ones that had a focus on the entire family, uh, agriculture, um, and now specifically black men. I think we do an entire stream on Household of Ruth, um, which is the black women's auxiliary, or the women's auxiliary in the United States, primarily black women. Uh, I have this entire box, this whole box, box three of this collection is just Household of Ruth. I think we do an entire stream for the Household of Ruth materials. <clears throat> Uh, it will not be next week, though. Uh, next week, let me go ahead and pull up my schedule so that I remember what is on the schedule for next week. But I will add it into the list. One moment. Do, 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 do. Do, 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 do. I'm just waiting for the document to open. Um, coming up next week, we have uh, Sorry. <laughs> Alerts from my computer asking me to do things. I'm like, I don't want to do that, especially not right now. Um, Right, okay, next week we have uh, late 19th and early 20th century diabetes guides and cookbooks. Uh, if you remember, when was it? It was maybe two or three weeks ago. Uh, oh, it was when we were doing the National Grange stuff. So back on the 13th, uh, we found a cookbook that had uh, like was from the first half of the 20th century and had an entire section on diabetes recipes. Uh, and uh, Kira, one of the other archivists here, mentioned in chat that we have quite a few um, specific nutrition guides from the 1900s and early 20th century um, focused on diabetes nutrition and diabetes recipes. And so we threw it on the list. So that is the plan for next week. I, that one will take a little bit of work for me to gather together the materials, um, but that is what we will be looking at next week. Um, and then we'll look at, for May 11th, uh, we will look at do, oh wait, no. Yes, yes, no, that'll work. Uh, we'll look at uh, May 11th doing Household of Ruth. Um, we're near, we're nearly to the point of, uh, an item that I put on my schedule way back in January, uh, but that has a very specific date that it needed to happen. Um, so I, I have one blank week between now and when it happens, but, uh, coming up, so next week is 19th and 20th century diabetes guides then we'll have Household of Ruth, then we'll have, uh, right now I have penciled in the Robert Marshak papers for the 18th of May, uh, the BP Blazing Game papers for the 25th of May. I currently have nothing planned for June 1st, but June 8th, we have a collection titled 1982 Celebration of 25 Years of Fortran. I know nothing about this collection, except that it is apparently a collection of materials about the 25th anniversary of Fortran that happened in 1982. The reason it's scheduled for June 8th is because of when the anniversary of Fortran happens. Uh, which... I, I don't no, there was in my researching, ah, yes, um, no, I don't know. I'm looking, I am looking, I am looking. 
sometime around then. Like, that was the closest stream day to the anniversary of Fortran. Uh, so, I, who knows? It just seemed interesting to me. We have materials. I thought, why not? So, that that is coming up in a couple of weeks' time, the beginning of June. Anyway, I should probably get us set up for a raid um, because we are four minutes over time. I hope you all enjoyed um, uh, exploring the um, Blacksburg Oddfellows records with me today. Um, we'll get to Household of Ruth in two weeks' time. Um, let me go ahead and just look. I think <clears throat> we are going to head over to um, Monterey, Monterey Bay Aquarium. June 9th. Yeah, so uh, thank you, Hannah. I was trying to do a quick search and it wasn't working. So we're streaming on June 8th, so uh, we'll be just one day off of the actual anniversary. Um, it looks like we have the jellyfish cam today on Monterey Bay Aquarium, so that is where we're gonna head. I do wanna thank you all for coming today. I hope that I see you again soon for another episode of Archival Adventures. Um, until then, I hope that you get out there and explore some wonderful history on your own. Um, I look forward to seeing you again soon.